Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching how the Muslims conquered Spain by kings and generals. So yes, we finally have another episode in the early Muslim expansion series. It has been a while since we've done a reaction to this series, so forgive me if I'm a little rusty. Last time, we saw some Muslim incursions into India and continued skirmishes with the Byzantine Empire. Now, we will be turning westwards to a topic that I've been interested in throughout this entire series. How did the Caliphate conquer Spain? I'm excited to see. If you guys enjoy this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked in the description down below, and will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. In our previous video, we covered the eastern frontier of the Umayyad Caliphate during a period of unprecedented expansion under the recently ascended Caliph al-Walid, as mm. protracted conflicts in Transoxiana and Sindh pushed the borders of the Caliphate ever further, greatly increasing the power of Governor al-Hajjaj, who as the overseer of all the Caliph's eastern provinces, had grown more influential than most kings. Right. Last time, we were way far east, as far east as the Caliphate had ever gone, right up to the borders of India, and as we saw, making incursions into India. Now, we go all the way west, as far west as the Caliphate has ever gone, to the western part of North Africa, and then up into the Iberian Peninsula. Moreover, it was not only in Asia that the Umayyads, so recently on the brink of civil war, were seeing renewed successes. Yes. At the same time, Muhammad ibn Qasim's army was... Well, last time was more of a successful time, last episode, for the Umayyad Caliphate, because before that, honestly, we would had a couple of videos, a rather long period of civil war, civil conflict, civil strife. Seems like the Caliphate is a bit more unified now, at least temporarily, and it's now focused once again on expansion. Sweeping through Sindh, another new frontier was being invaded thousands of miles to the west, the land of Iberia, under the control of the Germanic Visigoths. Right. Across such a vast area, the Caliphate was being exposed to many different cultures. But you don't have to invade Iberia to find out what the Germanic Visigoths are talking about these days. You can view the internet through their eyes using our sponsor, NordVPN, at nordvpn.com <laughs> slash kingsandgenerals. If you're not aware, if I mean, you guys know the deal. Please go and check out this video from Kings and Generals. It is linked down below. Go click on their link. Go give them a like. Go check out their sponsor. Show them support for making this fantastic content. I'm going to let their ad play through because this is a new video. But basically, I'm encouraging you guys to go and show them that support. Buy things through other countries because many items will have their pricing altered by region, especially useful for buying digital goods like games. Alternatively, you can access your home markets and services while you're traveling. Handy. Ooh. And of course, by using NordVPN, your connections are encrypted, your data is made safe, and with threat protection enabled, you'll be defended against malware and viruses wow. too. Wow, what a handy Open service, guys. <laughs> and see what's really out there by signing up to NordVPN. You guys should use Kings and Generals link. Slash Kings and Generals, and you'll get an extra gift thrown in on top when you buy a two-year plan. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving it a try. That's nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. All right, back to the caliphate. The Visigothic kingdom of Iberia could trace its roots back to Alaric, the famous general who first fought for emperor. Great, I'm glad we're getting a bit of a throwback here because when we talk about Iberia, you know, after the fall of the West or, you know, even during the degradation of the West, I don't know much about the Iberian Peninsula in that time period. And then, you know, basically between now and Reconquista, you know, we've got a long time period. I really do not know much about it. I know it's conquered by the Muslims. It's held by the Muslims for a long time. There's fighting between Muslims and Christians, then Reconquista. And then, you know, we zoom back forward. And then I know a bit about that and Spanish Empire. But what's in between? I'm quite, um, my, my knowledge, there's a big gap there. So I'm excited to learn a bit about that. Emperor Theodosius against the Franks, holding the Balkans as a Roman fuedorati, or semi-autonomous mm. ally, 
before his relationship with the Empire soured, and he became the first person to sack the Eternal City in over 700 years. Yeah, had been a sign of bad things to come for the city of Rome and the Roman Empire, particularly the Western Roman Empire as a whole. In one of the several so-called barbarian peoples to arrive in the territory of the crumbling Roman Empire, with various Gothic and other Germanic peoples found in great numbers throughout the empire and on its outskirts as slaves, soldiers and allies. Mm. In the aftermath of Western Rome's fall, the Visigoths were among the first to carve out their own kingdom from its ashes. Though Alaric's power base had been in the Balkans, the Visigoths would migrate ever westward following his death, at times allies of convenience to the collapsing Roman Empire, and at other times taking advantage of the West's fall to expand their power. It would be in the Aquitaine. Well, you know, as we see here, fast forwarded a little bit, as the Western Roman Empire begins to crumble, a bunch of these, what the Romans would call barbarian kingdoms, spring up in its place. And so, where Western Rome dissipates, we see a bunch of new European powers that will, many of them, evolve into the more modern European powers we might be familiar with today, whereas, as we've seen throughout this series, Roman authority holds much stronger in the East, with the Eastern Roman Empire, aka the Byzantine Empire, which, you know, is going to have a real hard time at points, but manages to retain a lot of territory and even reconquer some of the lost Western Roman territory. But basically, as Western Rome collapses, we're looking at a sort of new map of the region. Ten region of Western France that the Visigoths would first establish a true kingdom. From there, pushing into Suebi controlled Hispania at Rome's behest. Their kingdom encompassing Aquitaine and nearly the entire Iberian Peninsula by the death of the great warrior and lawmaker King Euric in 484. Mm. The years that followed would be less kind, however, as easy expansion against the backdrop of a crumbling Rome gave way to new rivalries against. And if we look at this map, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and the Vandals, they are three of the most powerful peoples who take a lot of that land lost by the Romans. To other powerful barbarian kingdoms, most notably the Franks and Burgundians. Mm. It would not be long after Euric's death, during the reign of his successor, Alaric II, that the Visigothic territories in France would fall to these northern rivals, led yes. by the Merovingian king Clovis, leading to- But, as we can see, the Franks are on the rise, and they will remain on the rise, or at least will remain quite powerful for a long, long time. To the establishment of Toledo as the new Visigothic capital. With the Pyrenees now forming a natural border, the Visigothic kingdom would remain secure in Hispania for the next two centuries. And think about it, what is that modern day border between France and Spain? Well, it primarily runs along the Pyrenees mountains. So this is what I mean when you know, we look at this time period as we enter the Middle Ages from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, we see a lot of different things that will evolve into what we know today. Still a long way to go, many, many changes to occur, but I think this is an interesting time for Europe. With occasional further conflicts with the Franks and a revanchist Eastern Roman Empire making little hmm. lasting change to the status quo. As Revanchist, by the way, for those that don't know, means it wants to reclaim its lost territory. And that's a good way to describe the Eastern Roman Empire. As the 8th century dawned, though, the Visigoths would unexpectedly find a far greater danger arising to their south. The Umayyad Caliphate's border with the Visigothic Kingdom had been an embattled one since their first arrival, with mm. raids into southern Iberia having begun as early as 706 following the conquest of Tangier in today's Morocco. In fact, the campaign that would spell the end of the Visigothic Kingdom likely began as another of these large-scale raids, with the force of some 1,700 that crossed the Strait of Gibraltar in 710 under the leadership of Tariq ibn Ziyad. Yeah, I imagine the Visigoths must have been pretty damn surprised when the Caliphate suddenly showed up on their southern doorstep. I mean, I'm sure they've had to deal with enemies from the south before, but nothing of this scale, 
as we've seen, they've primarily been worried about enemies to the north. And all of a sudden, we have this new, powerful, growing, martial empire that has expanded all the way from Arabia through North Africa and is now right on the borders of their kingdom. That's got to be a sort of rude awakening. Governor of Tangier, being quite sizable for a skirmishing party, but smaller than would be expected had they intended a campaign of conquest from the beginning. Mm. But circumstances favoured the Muslims. Following the recent death of King Witiza, the Visigothic Kingdom had entered into a succession crisis, with Roderick in control of southern Iberia, pitted against the poorly documented Angela II in the north. However, this low-intensity civil war was only indicative of larger weaknesses within the Visigothic Kingdom. While the Visigoths had ruled Iberia independently for more than two centuries at this point, and had exercised great autonomy under a weakened Rome for another century before their independence, mm. they had continued to rule on essentially tribal lines, despite the scale of their kingdom rendering them inefficient. The feudal systems that would allow later kingdoms to efficiently raise armies through local vassals did not yet exist in Iberia. That's fascinating, and to describe the feudal system as efficient is an odd thing, but if we think about it from this context, if your options are either A, have a big, powerful, centralized empire, yeah, that's probably the best way to mobilize manpower, but they don't have that. <laughs> what they're doing is, like kings and generals put it, relying on the former tribal system, which in this case is actually less efficient than would be a feudal system which is developing throughout uh, a lot of Europe at this point, as the central authority of the Roman Empire has fallen, uh, it's been gone for a while at this point, these feudal relationships, this feudal system has been developing, well, frankly, it started developing before Western Rome even fell, and so it's really getting into full force in a lot of places, but that's not the case here. And as they mentioned, even before Western Rome officially fell, its authority had declined massively. The empire had already degenerated, and so a lot of the territory that was technically under the control of Rome was, in actuality, being ruled by different peoples or different kingdoms, such as the Visigoths. And while the landed aristocratic class of the Roman period had essentially merged with the Visigothic conquerors to form a unified ruling class, the ethnic Visigoths that still made up most of the readily available warriors the various Visigothic chiefs could draw on made up only a very small minority in the larger kingdom. King Recared's abandonment of the Aryan sect of Christianity, traditionally followed by the Visigoths in 589 in uh -oh. favor of their kingdom's majority Chalcedonian Christian faith, accompanied by the abandonment of the Gothic tongue as a church language, had done much to unify the Visigoths with their subjects. However, the Hispano-Roman aristocrats had not been a warrior nobility, and the kingdom lacked efficient administrative systems. By the way, I think it's just really fascinating, once again, this is a real interesting time in European history. And, you know, if we want to look at sort of the formation of modern Europe, well, I mean, we can look at the entire history of Europe. Um, and, I mean, I'm a fan of the 16-1700s, but looking at this time period, we can really see some of that r real important development. The formation of, say, in this case, sort of the modern Spanish people, sort of the local Iberian tribes, the Romans, the Visigoths, uh, all of this will, plus, uh, you know, s other migrants from other places that still have a long time to show up before we get to modern Spain, a lot of this is coming together over the span of hundreds, thousands of years to form that country we know as Spain uh, and, and Portugal, of course, in the west of the Iberian Peninsula. Just some real interesting stuff. By which to mobilize its peasantry to war. While every denizen of the Visigothic Kingdom was theoretically required to provide military service to the king on demand, this duty was owed directly to the king, rather than to a more accessible local intermediary, making it a duty only too easy to ignore for the vast right. majority of the population outside Toledo and the king's own domain. And so this is the point I'm making. Sure, if you have a powerful centralized empire like the Romans once did, then yeah, service to the government or service to the king or emperor, that works because you can enforce that. But 
if you have a weaker, more decentralized system like this, this is where feudalism comes into play. If you, as the king, cannot mobilize that sort of manpower, then you, you're you going to have to devolve some of that power to your lords. And ta-da, there we get feudalism. <laughs> Thus, while the caliphate had been able to vastly expand its power through its conquests, through recruiting large numbers of converts in conquered territories for further campaigns, and by embracing the sophisticated administrative systems left behind by the Romans and Persians, coupled with laws laid down in the Quran, the military power of the Visigothic Kingdom was not fundamentally changed from the tribal armies that had fought Rome under Alaric, mm. its army still made up in large part by the personal warriors of Visigothic chiefs. Just yeah, they're not on the same level, the Visigoths ain't ready. And if you look at the forces of the Caliphate, drawing on the Quran, of course, and then drawing on from administrative systems taken from the Sassanids and the Romans, yeah, these are some good sources to learn from, I'll put it that way. Despite the vastly larger Latin population they ruled over. In addition to the relative unpreparedness of their foes, the Arabs had a valuable ally on their side, Count oh. Julian of Ceuta, who was most likely a Byzantine uh. governor who had switched his allegiance upon his empire's abandonment of North Africa, rather than attempting to fight a doomed resistance against the Arabs. While it seems he aided by providing his suzerain ships for the crossing of the Strait of Gibraltar, his larger role in the story is somewhat in question. Mm. Despite his importance in later accounts, which claim he had made the first attack on Iberia with his own forces in 709, seizing loot with which to entice the Arabs to destroy Roderick for him and avenge his daughter's rape at the Visigothic king's hands. No mention of this grudge exists in the Mozarabic Chronicle of 754. Yeah, okay, so once again, we gotta look at our sources. So, it could be that Julian played an important role. It could be. Uh, it could be that he had some specific grudge he wanted to avenge, but... If we don't necessarily see this in earlier sources, and then it gets brought up later, um, and of course, you know, avenge his daughter's rape by the king, you know, that is a very specific grievance to have. Um, probably also an unlikely grievance. Maybe some of this is constructed later. Maybe Julian wasn't as involved. Maybe he was involved for a different reason. Once again, we don't really have the sources to say. We just have to be skeptical and question what we know and what we read. The earliest surviving account of the invasion. And neither Julian's subservience to the more powerful Arabs, nor Musa's predictable decision to expand into the rich lands of the Visigoths, require any tales of vengeance to explain. Mm. The accounts that paint Julian as the architect of the Visigothic kingdom's conquest also clash with both the Mozarabic Chronicle's assertion that Arab raiding had begun years before the conquest and with the common narratives of later Christian accounts, which claim that it was the enemies of Roderick within Iberia that requested and facilitated the Muslim invasion. While any of these stories might be at least partially true, they are likely irrelevant. With North Africa subjugated and inhospitable, with difficult to traverse desert to the south, the Caliphate's invasion of Hispania was an inevitability, whether Roderick was guilty of raping Julian's daughter or not. I think this is a good point. Now, we have to look at the information we have. Looking at this situation, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world that the Muslims would continue north into the Iberian Peninsula. Now, did they have other reasons for doing so, aside from the obvious ones? Maybe. I mean, they've just listed a bunch of potential reasons, but we can't really truly substantiate any of those. So, what we do is we go, well, it makes sense they made this move. They probably used these reasons, and they might have used any number of these reasons, which may or may not be true. <laughs> and Julian would have been compelled to support Musa as a caliphal vassal, with or without any personal grudge. Right, and exactly. Anecdotally, as a side note, the modern name of the Strait of Gibraltar is named for Tariq, in a corruption of the Arabic Jabal Tariq, or Tariq's Mountain. Huh. The renewal of raiding in the south went at first unanswered by the Visigoths, allowing Tariq to establish a secure base of operations on the site that would later become the town of Algeciras, from there pushing deeper into Iberia. They would face their first opponent shortly after, Theodomir, a Visigothic count holding extensive territories near Mercia, who, with his force of some 1,700 men, 
attempted to delay the invaders in a series of skirmishes while sending reports and pleas for aid back to Roderick. And by the way, we sort of passed over this without mentioning it, but this is the furthest the Caliphate has really made it into Europe. Now, you can look eastwards towards um, the conflict with the Byzantine Empire, and Muslims have been pushing up and you know, through, to a certain extent, Anatolia, a couple of the islands of the eastern Mediterranean. But, you know, primarily, this is really the farthest they've made it. Though, that distinction probably isn't as important as we would make it today. I mean, still, at this point, we're talking about a sort of shared Mediterranean world, though, over time, that shared Mediterranean world is and will disintegrate as sort of the centralizing power of Rome falls apart, and we see a lot of different cultures developing in different areas, um, and these European kingdoms forming. So that distinction sort of is important, especially to our eyes, and will be more important later on, but at this point maybe isn't that important. The establishment of this base, and the arrival of further Muslim reinforcements, quickly demonstrated to Roderick that this was no common raid, and he began assembling what forces he could muster at Cordoba, sending a force of mm. cavalry ahead to aid Theodomir in his resistance, and instructing the Count to withdraw northward to join him. Meanwhile, he began his own much slower march south, hindered by poor logistics, the slow arrival of reinforcements from disloyal vassal chieftains, and a lack of discipline among the conscripted serfs. <laughs> he finally regrouped with the battered remnants of Theodomir's force at Guadalete, their numbers weakened after a series of skirmishes over at least a month that greatly favoured the mobile Berber cavalry making up the bulk mm. of Tariq's forces, which had also been mercilessly raiding the countryside so as to force Roderick into a battle on the field. Guadalete yeah, and if it comes out to an all-out military conflict with both sides committing all their resources, there's no question that the Caliphate would obviously win. I mean, the Caliphate has smashed the Sassanid Persian Empire, and seriously weakened the Eastern Roman Empire. But, of course, this is far away from the center of the Caliphate, right? Uh, the Caliphate is the richest and most central lands of the Caliphate. We're primarily talking about sort of the Middle East. Some of that former Persian land, Egypt, um, the Middle East more broadly... We are all the way across North Africa and now in Spain. It's quite a long way. And so the question isn't necessarily a full-on military conflict between the Caliphate and the Visigoths in which both sides sent in all their resources. It's really, you know, how much does the Caliphate need to commit to defeat the Visigoths? Because it's a long way to send resources. They're stretched out pretty far. Um, so that's sort of the situation we're in. Day would soon be the site of a historically pivotal but poorly documented battle that has been the basis of countless conflicting tales and legends. Hmm. The numbers involved are very much in question, with later Christian chronicles claiming as high as 187. What? Not, I mean, I don't know much about this, but that seems extremely unlikely. That is a gigantic army. And I just made the point that this is pretty far <laughs> for the Caliphate to send resources. This would have to be one of the biggest armies it's ever assembled. That's got to be impossible. Though the number given for the Muslim forces in the Mozarabic Chronicle, 7,000 in Tariq's initial landing force, <laughs> with 5,000 reinforcements, bringing the total to 12,000... That is a gigantic discrepancy. ...is likely at least significantly inflated as well. It is at least plausible considering the readiness of converted Berbers to join Musa's forces across yeah. subjugated North Africa. Yeah, that seems more accurate, if even a little high. At 12,000, there's not a chance it was anywhere near or above 100,000. 12,000 is definitely far more accurate. <laughs> No figures are given for the Visigothic fall. Of course, and this is the issue we've run into before, with, first off, we don't have a lot of sources for this, and then a lot of the sources that we do have are from much later and are conflicting. We're talking about Muslim sources versus Christian sources, and then, of course, we get into the bias from both sides, and it becomes very difficult to work out what exactly is true. Sources under Roderick. 
save a similarly unlikely 100,000 claimed by later Arab chronicles. The defenders did most likely outnumber the invaders, with over 30,000 in the highest modern estimates. Yeah, and you can imagine that the Visigoths would outnumber the Muslim forces, though they're having trouble gathering a large army. This is where they're based. You know, this is their territory. They should be able to gather more men. Once again, 100,000? Yeah, it seems extremely unrealistic. Though given the previously mentioned challenges in mobilizing their Hispano-Roman subjects, even mm. a number half this large is likely generous. But they wow. face problems of disloyalty that undermined their small numbers advantage. Yeah, I mean, look, we're <laughs> past the era of gigantic Roman armies. Uh, we are into the Middle Ages at this point, and during this period, an army of, frankly, 20,000 is a pretty impressive army. Most armies would be less than that. A lot of armies would be less than 10,000. Now, in this series, we have seen some very large Muslim armies, some large Persian armies, and some large Eastern Roman armies, but these are more the exception, not the rule. And so 30,000, you know, that would be a very large army. As they said, we very well could be talking about a force less than half that size. Some recurring themes found in both Muslim and Christian sources may shed some light on the events of the bloody July day. Mm. The previously mentioned Mazarabic Chronicle of 754, though a useful source for information on the Visigothic Kingdom's history and politics, mentions the Battle of Guadalete only in passing and elaborates little on the tactics involved. It does, however, make it clear that many of the more powerful Visigothic tribal leaders had only feigned their support when accompanying hmm. their king to battle, intending to lead Roderick to his downfall and claim the throne themselves. And while later accounts are of questionable reliability, this general narrative of betrayal surrounding the kingdom's fall remains a constant. Some accuse Roderick of having had Witteza assassinated in a coup attempt, while many other accounts are quite hostile towards Witteza and his line as a result mm. of the late king's anti-clerical policies, with villainizing. Okay, so once again, we cannot guarantee this is true, but at the very least, if we have common themes throughout sources, that gives those themes a little more credibility. I think at least what we can draw is that, as we've seen, the Visigoths were rather divided, having a hard time mobilizing loyal men, uh, the king was having a hard time mobilizing loyal nobility. Um, partially, that seems to have been due to the religious split. So, we don't know how many men the Visigoths necessarily had, but, you know, they were having a hard time gathering a lot of men, and a hard time gathering men who were loyal to the cause and disciplined. ...nation of Witteza growing harsher and more common as time passed. Witches's opposition to a series of discriminatory decrees by the Spanish church councils targeting Iberia's large Jewish population might have contributed ah. to this, given the- Okay, does anybody have any more information on this? How large was the Jewish population of Iberia? How prominent? How involved were they? Um, and if there was a large Jewish population, why exactly? Was there a particular reason for that? I'm very curious because something I do know is that during Reconquista, when the Christians pushed the Muslims out, they were also pushing out the Jewish population. And at that point, which is much later than this, there was a significant Jewish population. And it seems like, according to what kings and generals are saying, there was at this point as well. So I'd be very interested if some of you have uh, some more information on that. Growing hostility towards Europe's Jews in the era of the Crusades and Reconquista, a period that had seen renewed yep. interest in the fallen Visigothic kingdom and to which many of these later chronicles trace. Many of these chronicles even suggest that two sons of Witteza, seeking to claim their father's throne, had invited the Arabs into Iberia, or that Iberia's Jews had used their close ties to the Jews of North Africa to do the same, seeking an opportunity to end their long suffering under the harsh anti-Semitic mm. policies of the Visigothic kingdom and its... And so something like that could be true, but you want to be especially skeptical when dealing with, say, Christian sources talking about Jews at this time period, because, you know, they sort of have an incentive to paint Muslims and Jews as negatively as possible. 
especially with the anti-Semitism of this time period and a long time afterwards. It's church, which since 694 had even allowed for any Jew refusing baptism to be enslaved. Ugh. Neither story Jeez. seems likely, yeah. especially considering Witteser was unlikely to have been older than 25 himself when he died, making any children he might have had rather young for such scheming. But hmm. whatever the case, if anyone had hoped to take advantage of the Muslim incursion to claim the Visigothic throne, they would be very disappointed. Roderick had his loyal Visigothic warriors, armoured and bearing axes and swords, split into two contingents, the larger making up the centre of the vanguard, and a smaller detachment held in reserve. Behind these staunch defenders, the ill-equipped levies he had raised from his domain around Toledo and during the mustering at Cordoba were arrayed, in a particularly sorry state even for peasant conscripts. Jeez. Roderick's hurry. I'm honestly kind of surprised you wouldn't put them at front, uh, at the front, so that, uh, one, they won't run away because your loyal troops will be behind them, and two, if they're really in that much of a sorry state, you feel like Roderick would just use them as meat shields, basically. Um, you know. So I'm kind of surprised he placed them at the back. Maybe they were that useless that he didn't even want to engage them in the battle? I don't know. ...to engage the invaders, leaving little time to see these slaves and serfs equipped or drilled. On the wings were the forces of allied chieftains, many of questionable loyalty, and <laughs> the kingdom's comparatively meagre cavalry remaining after the losses inflicted during Theodomir's fighting retreat. Mm. Tarek, though outnumbered, had far more cavalry than his foe, and fewer concerns of morale and loyalty. Though the majority of the Arab warriors that had come forth from Syria to conquer North Africa had either returned home or remained behind with Musa, he had a strong contingent of heavily equipped Arab cavalry making up his army's centre, with Berber and Arab infantry behind them, while Berber light cavalry on the wings and in the rearguard made up the bulk of his army. And I mean, we've seen that the Caliphate has always had a great cavalry, whether we're talking about the Arab cavalry, or in this case, Berber cavalry, some very talented cavalrymen here. So certainly a formidable force to go up against, especially if the Visigoths are not as well trained, and if a lot of these noble cavalry are not particularly loyal to their king. Accounts vary greatly, but it would seem that the first two days of fighting remained more or less in the balance, with both armies suffering mounting casualties and with greater Visigothic numbers seemingly giving them the edge at first. Okay, okay. Both leaders encouraged their forces with speeches, Tarek chastising his forces for falling back during the second day's fighting, claiming that only by holding fast and seizing victory could they hope to survive and return home, and mm. promising to lead them to riches and glory on the following day. Ooh. When the third day's fighting began, Tarek would prove true to his word, personally leading his heavier cavalry in a charge that broke through the Visigothic warriors, making a- I will say, this is a real common trend we've seen throughout this series, and I'm not sure if it's due to some reality of uh, the armies of the Caliphate, or if it's due to some common trend amongst the chroniclers and historians of this period, maybe some of you can tell me. But I feel like a lot of the battles we've seen, what happens is, you know, the two armies get into conflict, there's some back and forth fighting, maybe the enemy army has a bit of an upper hand, and then, you know, a couple days in or however long in, the Muslim army sort of regroups, leads a cavalry charge, and gains the advantage. You know, I feel like this is a pattern that we've seen over and over and over again. Um... And maybe that's due to the composition of the Muslim armies, or how exactly they function, or the strength of their cavalry, versus perhaps the weakness of their infantry. I'm not sure. Or once again, it might be due to chroniclers and historians sort of using the same archetype for each battle they write about. I mean, ancient or medieval historians have been known to do that at times. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe some of you have uh, more insight on that. Up Roderick Center. With the enemy vanguard depleted by two days' fighting, Tarek's cavalry soon found themselves with nothing but scattering serf levies between them and the enemy leaders and rearguard, 
with mm. the Muslim infantry taking advantage of the breach and following closely behind. The circumstances of the following rout are unclear. A Visigothic leader slain early in the charge seems to have been mistaken by the Muslims for Roderick, starting a false rumour of the king's death uh -oh. that hastened panic and desertion in an army already held together by very little. Yeah. Some accounts claim that much of the Visigothic cavalry under Bishop Opper, a possibly illegitimate son of Wittus's father and predecessor Educa, defected to Tariq as part of a prearranged betrayal. And while this claim is rather doubtful... Yeah, we've got a lot of rumors going around. With this battle, you know, seems like with every event that occurs, first off, we don't know exactly what happened, and second off, there are five different stories for what possibly could have happened. A betrayal here, someone fleeing here, someone doing this, that, or the other, and we don't have very strong evidence for any of it. It is clear that many did desert the king as the tables began to turn. A general rout soon followed as the levies broke and the Berber cavalry charged the enemy flanks, running down fleeing soldiers. Though Roderick's personal forces put up a staunch defense despite their broken lines, inflicting sizable casualties, the premature rumor of the king's death would soon prove to have come only a few hours too early, and by the fierce battle's end, the king and a sizable portion of the Visigothic nobility had been slain. Mm. Though nearly 3,000, close to a quarter of the Muslim force had been among the casualties, wow. losses had been far greater for the defeated Visigoths, and their kingdom would not long outlive their fallen king. With the Visigothic kingdom so reliant on the military dominance of its ruling minority, and commanding little loyalty from its subjects, this single crushing defeat effectively spelled its end. Tariq was quick to march to Toledo in the aftermath, where Opa, who does not in fact seem to have been present at Guadalete despite later claims of his <laughs> battlefield betrayal, had taken the Visigothic throne. Opa would prove a ready collaborator with the conquerors, aiding oh. them in capturing and executing many of the remaining Visigothic chiefs and nobility as they made to flee the capital. Seven. So, I mean, it seems like Visigothic rule was not super steady beforehand. It was based on the military dominance of this minority, and there had been some infighting before, some controversy, and so you get a strong invader like the Muslims, and everything sort of starts to fall apart. Though this fellow, Opa, is a collaborator, interestingly enough. Um, I'm curious to see how... Muslim control is established over the Iberian Peninsula, and also what happens to that Visigothic rule, that Visigothic ruling elite. Um, do they stick around somehow? Are they sort of sublimated into the ruling order of the Caliphate, or do they leave? Uh, I'm curious to see how this situation evolves. 12 would see Musa cross the strait with another army to join his victorious underling in pacifying the remainder of Iberia with Tariq's army splitting into four in order to more swiftly overcome what little scattered resistance wow. remained. Because, I mean, we had this one big battle <laughs> in the south uh, of Spain, and now the Muslim armies are spreading out across the entire Iberian Peninsula, setting up garrisons. You know, that was a very quick shift. Some cities would put up spirited defenses, with Seville requiring a three-month siege and Merida 5 for Musa's army to capture, hmm. and with Seville even rising shortly in late 713 in a rebellion crushed by Musa's son, Abdelaziz. However, the Visigoths' unpopularity in the urban centers, such as Cordoba, left many ready to accept their new conquerors, and even the Mozarabic Chronicle, though quite hostile towards the Arabs, makes note of Cordoba's flourishing after its later establishment as the capital of the new caliphal province of Al-Andalus in 716. Mm. And, I mean, we've seen this before in other territories conquered by the caliphate. You know, at this point, you know, life is pretty tough for a lot of people. <laughs> Most people are farmers or serfs of some sort, and they may not be treated super well by whatever government they're laboring under. In fact, they may not have very much interaction with that government at all. And so if the armies of the Caliphate arrive and they promise to treat them fairly uh, and not bother them too much, 
then if you're just a regular farmer or a serf or whatever, you might say, well, this doesn't seem any worse than the place I was before. In fact, it might even be better. So really, what's the point of putting up resistance, right? And like I said, we've seen this in a lot of different places. Though Opa and some new other figures from the old ruling class retained a degree of their former status through collaboration, ah. there would okay. be no more Visigothic kings, and their lines quickly fade into obscurity. If Opa, Angela, or any others had indeed conspired with the Muslims to take the throne, their ploy had failed. With the okay, so basically what happened was that that Visigothic ruling elite was, well, a lot of it was stamped out, but the remaining collaborators were allowed to sort of melt into the new ruling elite, but weren't given powerful positions necessarily. So, basically sublimated into the Muslim ruling elite to a certain extent. The Visigoths being assimilated into the larger Iberian Christian population and their power broken. Mm. In their place, Musa placed Arabs in most positions of power within the newly conquered state. Though the Muslims did also rely heavily on Iberia's Jews to help hold and administer their new territory. With the harsh restrictions put in place by the Visigoths lifted, Jewish communities were among the most eager in accepting the change of rulership, and Makes many sense. Jews rose to positions of prominence as advisors and officials under the comparatively even-handed governance huh. of early Al-Andalus. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, as I mentioned, when we have Reconquista centrally, centuries later, what happens is the Christians will uh, remove both the Muslims and the Jews from Iberia. And you know where a lot of the Jews go? They go to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, brings a lot of those Spanish Jews in who have been removed or kicked out of Iberia and brings them to the Ottoman Empire. So, how about that? You know, a close relationship in many different ways between uh, the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula and Muslims in several different instances. However, this story would end in tragedy even for many of the victors, and Musa and Tariq would not enjoy the fruits of their success for long. By 715, they had completed the initial conquest of the peninsula, wow. overrunning- Look at how fast that was, my goodness. I mean, we're talking about the span of four years and I'm not sure how secure Muslim rule is, but look at this massive amount of territory they've just seized. Not to mention, now they have a couple of new neighbors. <laughs> They're right on the borders of uh, the Frankish kingdom, uh, Aquitaine in particular. The lands of the Basques and the northern territories held by Angular, who disappeared from the record, making his supposed collaboration with the Arabs unlikely. Mm. But just as Musa had himself taken power in North Africa after the political disgrace of its conqueror, Hassan ibn al-Numan, Tariq and Musa, by this point feuding with each other over the spoils and glory of the conquest, a precursor for more Arab-Berber hostility to come, mm. would be summoned to Damascus by a sickly and aging al-Walid, only to find the Caliph already on his deathbed upon their arrival, and his brother Suleiman the acting monarch. Mired in a rocky succession, with Al-Walid having backed his son, Abdelaziz ibn Al-Walid, for the throne, Suleiman ordered Musa to delay his triumphant entrance into Damascus until after Al-Walid expired and he properly became caliph. In doing this, Suleiman hoped to claim some of the glory of the conquest to inaugurate his new reign. Musa refused, however, entering and dedicating his victory and the spoils to Al-Walid. Oh. This did little to ingratiate him with Suleiman, with predictable results after Al-Walid's death less than a week later. Tariq and Musa were both first stripped of their wealth, then disgraced and publicly wow. degraded as traitors. As Man, again? There is sort of a common trend with these successful conquering generals coming back from their conquests and then not being treated very well at all. I guess this is the politics of such a big empire. You know, it's not enough to be successful, talented, uh, a famed conqueror. You also have to be in with the ruling faction. And if you're not, you're getting yourself into a lot of trouble. Ostensibly in response to Musa's complaints towards the confiscation, but in all likelihood an inevitable part of the broader crackdown on Al-Walid's governors and loyalists that took place upon Suleiman's inauguration. 
Mm. The two conquerors of Al-Andalus would live the rest of their lives in obscurity, while Musa's Damn. sons, Abdelaziz and Abdullah, left behind as governors of Al-Andalus and Ifriqiya respectively, would both be killed on the Caliph's orders. Oh my god. Suleiman's mishandled efforts to assert his control over the far-flung provinces of the empire would backfire in Al-Andalus, however, with the death of Abdelaziz sparking a period of self-destructive infighting, spurred largely by the resentment among mm. the Berbers towards their lesser treatment compared to their Arab co-religionists. Man, we've seen this before. We saw this out east with a couple of different groups. Uh, the Persians, the Iraqis, uh, a bunch of different groups who, even though they had been brought into the Caliphate and they converted to Islam, they weren't being treated equally to their Arab fellow Muslims. And so, you know, fairly, they got upset, they revolted, because that's kind of the promise of the empire, right? We're all Muslims, we're all treated equally and fairly, and so we're seeing the exact same thing out west. And, you know, Suleiman, I get it, you know, you're in the new caliph, you want to establish control, but... It can be good to have some continuation of the prior ruling elite because, you know, they're actually governing the provinces you've just conquered. If you imprison and assassinate everybody, well, that's great. You can establish your control personally, but in that process, your empire might start to lose control of its territory. Despite playing such a vital role in Iberia's conquest, with the conquerors turned against each other, their hold in Iberia would begin to show cracks almost as swiftly as they had won it, with wow. the mountainous northern territories breaking away under the Visigothic noble Pelagius to form the Kingdom of Asturias in 722. Mm. It was not the far-flung western frontier of Iberia that Suleiman would spend his short reign focused on, however. Eager to forge his own legacy to match his brothers in the short time remaining to him, he would soon turn the armies of the Caliphate towards a prize long denied them, Constantinople. Okay. Oh. In our next episode on early Ooh. Islamic history... More conflict with the Byzantines. How very exciting. We will cover the Caliphate's strike into the heart of the Eastern Roman Empire. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video. All right, sounds very good. And by the way, you could also join my channel's Patreon, links down below, or our channel member program. You just gotta hit that join button next to the subscribe button and you will get exclusive reaction content. Wow, this was a great episode. I'm very excited to see that conflict with the Byzantines, Muslims striking at the heart of the empire. Always very fascinating stuff. I hope we get the next episode uh, a little sooner than we got this one, but I understand it takes time to make this fantastic content, and Kings and Generals has a lot of other videos that they're releasing, so I get it. Uh, but yeah, this was a great episode. Uh, we finally got a look at the Iberian Peninsula. This is something I've been interested in for a while, you know, because we've seen the Caliphate expand and we've seen it expand continually westward across North Africa. And as someone who doesn't know much about the history, but, you know, has seen a map <laughs> of the fullest extent of the Caliphate, I'm saying, well, I know they're going to reach Spain at some point. So I'm curious, when are they going to reach it? How's it going to happen? Well, we finally got an answer to that question Really a remarkably quick conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, though, you know, we've seen the Caliphate expand remarkably quick in every direction. Um, yeah, some real interesting stuff. I had a good time with this one. Uh, I hope you guys did. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.